Yeah, so we still have openings for the next uh, next workshop and meetup. Um, so if anyone would like to present a piece of software and kind of demonstrate its use in real time, uh, send a message to us at SODA. And then if anyone would like to give a SODA meetup talk, or if you know anyone that you would like to see talk or give a workshop, uh, yeah, please uh, encourage them to visit our website and to sign up with the SODA information. Um, well, with that being said, uh, my name is Daniel. I'm one of the co-chairs and I'm a, a software engineer at the Metabolomics platform at the Broad Institute, kind of leading the informatics efforts there. And uh, the other co-chair, uh, Yuen, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Yue. I'm a postdoc at uh, oh. staff at Max Nader's lab. I'm mostly doing precision medicine. We have two good presentations today, two great presentations. The first is over a, uh, by Troy Berland, is uh, a non-targeted QC and study design assistant tool and an evaluation of, um, we have non-targeted study design, and that'll be followed by Simone's presentation over um, uh over MAST, I think that's how it's pronounced, a uh, tool to a uh, taxonomically informed uh, MS2 search tool to help identify metabolites and microbial experiments. Uh, with that being said, uh, Troy, if you'd like to take it from here. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. Let me share my screen. Great. Uh, well, thanks for, for having me out. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I... I, to introduce myself, I'm a, a ORISE postdoctoral fellow uh, working in the Office of Research and Development at the Center for Computational Toxicology and Exposure uh, at the EPA. And uh, I'm working with uh, the folks in that center on the development of a, a web application meant to do uh, QAQC processing and feature annotation on the results of non-targeted analysis. Um, it's a it's an improvement on the EPA's approach, which typically been targeted analysis for uh, toxicology and uh, environmental remediation work, and so it's a it's a little bit um, different than the metabolomics work that I think this group uh, normally focuses on. But the, I think uh, some of the approaches are the same, right? We're looking for um, just a, a, a lot of different compounds and trying to do feature annotation, et cetera. Um, and so I'll be sharing a, a little bit about how the, our web application is working right now, and then a, a cost benefit analysis of this of study design based off of some feedback that we're getting from some uh, state stakeholders. Uh, and just, um, I'm required to say that uh, the results here are preliminary, the product of the ROAR partnership that the EPA is involved with, and uh, that therefore, you know, don't be, leaving and telling everybody about it. Obviously, I've anonymized all the data anyway, so it'll, it'll more be for a good uh, discussion of our results. Um, so again, taking a moment to thank those who are involved, particularly the state partners who contributed their ideas in the data, as well as various collaborators at ORD. I'd like to highlight Heather Whitehead, John Sobis, and James McCord, uh, who have uh, put in some big contributions to this effort. Um, and then before I go into the meat of our presentation, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, in terms of uh, definitions that we're going to be using. And, and this should probably look familiar to everyone here, but, you know, it's just starting at ground zero. Um, so a chemical feature is what we're going to define as the measurement of a chemical at a given mass to charge value and retention time. Uh, this feature is observed as a peak and that can be integrated into an abundance this abundance gives us an idea of the relative concentration of the chemical. And so our web application is meant to be taking input files of the samples, uh, replicates and features that you've measured in your study and then doing statistics and QAQC filtering on them. And so what that's gonna look like uh, is that we have our samples that are run multiple times as sample replicates. Let me change to a laser pointer here uh, and then we run in replicates to determine a level of reproducibility for a given feature, which is going to be uh, our rows here. Uh, and if a feature is real, it should have reproducible values across each of the sample replicates that it's observed in. Uh, and so, as I said, this is how our input data uh, should look as the users are approaching the web application, uh, where we have our chemical features in rows and their abundance uh, in columns. 
Uh, and as the data are processed, these sample replicates are condensed into a mean sample value. So now each one of our cells has a mean value for that sample of that feature. Uh, in, a, in a given observation is what we're going to call an occurrence, right? So these cells are occurrences. So later when we're talking about our resulting outputs, we're going to split the conversation into these occurrence level observations. So a sample of a, a, or a feature in a sample to uh, also feature level observations. So how is a feature performing across our entire data set? So now that we've got those three sort of basic terms, I'm gonna walk through on a sort of broad level what our web application is doing for feature filtering. Uh, so on the left, we have an example of uh, a representation of NTA data. There are five chemical features here each of which are coming out at a different retention time in our little cartoon. And each of the layers in our figure represents a, a different uh, observation, right? So we have this red layer in front, which is our, our observation of features in a blank. And then we have three layered uh, uh, cartoons in the back that are black here, uh, representing each of our observations across sample replicates. So as this input data is then input into the web app, we basically walk through these, these couple of steps. The first is determining if features are reproducible across our sample replicates. And so if we look at feature one, it's only present in a single one of our replicates. We determine that to not be real. And so we're gonna remove that feature from our data set. Uh, next, uh, we're gonna look at whether or not the feature, uh, its intensity uh, and its variation intensity, excuse me, between our replicates is, is acceptable. Uh, we have a user set uh, CV parameter, and if a uh, feature exceeds that requirement, it's going to be removed from the data set. And so we can see here feature two is in all three replicates, but it's highly variable, so we're going to remove it. Feature three is a chemical feature that matches uh, a, a tracer chemical, and in step through here, we're going to flag that and say, okay, well, we put that there, so we want to keep it in our set. And then finally, our step four is going to be to look at whether or not our features uh, exceed the intensity that we're measuring in the blanks. And so uh, feature four here is reproducible. It's uh, highly consistent in our measurement, and it's greater than the blank. Uh, feature five is reproducible and consistent, but same values are blank. So, we it. so ultimately, we get output that, that's cleaned of these different features based on whether or not they pass our user-defined thresholds. And in summary, the web app, again, takes our input data, makes filtering decisions, and provides us with outputs. And normally, the user would be focused on the identification of uh, uh, these features or the abundance of those features so they can go back and you know, make decisions about uh, or communicating to stakeholders and what they need to do at a given site. Um, but this data can also be considered from a more reductionist view of the filtering decisions that are made. So what are the occurrences that are being kept and which are being removed? And so I'm going to be representing our cartoon decisions in a sort of tabular output here where occurrences and features that are removed are going to be darkened out and features that are kept corresponding to cartoons that have made it through our filtering are gonna have the same color uh, as the, the peak that's there. And so we're gonna be looking at what occurrences are being kept and removed. And so we've been looking at single or uh, web app filters applied to a single sample group, but in the real data, obviously, we're going to be looking at features that have been aligned across multiple sample replicates as we're collecting our, our high resolution mass spectrometry data. So I'm representing this here with different colored replicate sets, and the web app is going to apply filtering decisions on each sample set, and we can follow along the filtering steps to see what decisions are made in our new hypothetical samples. So we have already walked through this, this gray sample set. Looking at sample set two, our feature two is again two variable. We've got one small peak and one large peak. That's removed. And feature five is below our minimum reporting limits, the same height as the boy. In sample set three, our green samples here, uh, feature two is only in one of our replicates. And so again, that's going to be removed. And so at, in summary, and uh, I should have mentioned in our gold box here, we sort of we have those different thresholds that we're thinking about for our filtering decisions. Uh, but in summary, when we go to look at our tabular output, we can say, okay, we, we had just done on the previous slide, sample one, we're losing features one, two, and five. And here we're looking at sample two, or uh, we lose feature two and five, and then sample three, we lose feature two. And so we can sort of aggregate 
uh, the decisions that are made on each of these occurrences across our greater data set. Now, in cases where all occurrences are removed for a given feature, and the logic steps that the web app takes specifically in our code is shown here, uh, then the entire feature is removed from the output and documented in the web app's filter documentation sheet, which is one of the tabular outputs that we, we provide to, to users. So we can see that across our example data set, that feature two is always removed. It's two variable in samples one and two, and then it's in too few replicates in sample three. Therefore, when we go to look at our tabular outputs, where we have another column here that's looking at our feature level decision, and feature two is going to be fully removed from this data. Now, to date, the gold standard for non-targeted analysis studies conducted at the EPA has been to analyze samples in triplicate. Uh, as mentioned previously, this approach lets us evaluate variants and replicates that provide QAQC value for determining what occurrences should be considered real or not when we're looking at different chemical features in, in our samples. However, NTA can be quite expensive, and for stakeholders hoping to conduct large-scale studies, there's interest in potentially cutting costs if the information trade-offs are acceptable. So the impacts of reducing replicate analysis is, is currently unconstrained and represents an avenue that we wanted to explore uh, at our client's behest. So let's look at a few examples of potential information penalties. In some cases, a reduction in sample replication may result in the loss of important information. So see here, we're looking at that sample three, our green sample from our previous slide. On top, we have that full triplicate analysis. And then in the scenario where we only have a single sample replicate, we're just using here that first, uh, first part of the cartoon, uh, we are no longer detecting feature five. It was only measured in replicates two and three here. So on an occurrence level, this would be the equivalent to not detecting a chemical at our specific site or location, but if this were uh, extrapolated out to a feature level, this would mean that we're no longer identifying feature fives in the chemical in our data set. So in some cases, we lose important information that would have otherwise been kept had we run our samples in triplicate. Now, information loss isn't the only concern. In other cases, reducing sample replication can result in us keeping occurrences and features that would have originally been removed from our samples. So again, now we're gonna look back at sample one, the grayscale sample from our previous slide, where we only had the first sample replicate feature. Uh, uh, we no longer fail uh, features one and feature two, right? So these were originally removed because of the replication and variance thresholds. However, when we reduce our replication, now features one and two uh, exceed our threshold because we can't measure a variance on a single point and we can't, uh, it's either all or nothing for replication. So in this case, we would keep noise that would otherwise have been removed had we run the triplicate. Now, again, from a bird's eye view, on the occurrence level, this is we're now detecting two new chemicals that aren't actually present in our sample. And at the feature level, we're identifying two chemical features that should no longer, shouldn't actually be in our data set. Now, in both examples we looked at, we simply kept the first sample replicate to illustrate our point, but from a combinatorial perspective, we should be considering the impacts of reducing replication uh, towards each possible option. So we have our first uh, injection, our first acquisition, our second, and our third. And when we do so, we can see the, re the results differ. So that again, this is our gray sample. Uh, where we drop features one, two, and five, and looking at the first, second, and third injections, the, these ultimately aren't the same. In the first injection, we keep sample one, or uh, feature one, excuse me, but in the second and third, we correctly throw it away. Um, but this is important to, in order for us to fully understand what the, all the possibilities are of reducing our replication on our information loss in this game. So we wanted to simulate uh, this web application filtering on all combinations of replicate reduction across our data set. So what uh, I did with our team is design an experiment for a data set with 10 samples uh, where we reduce the percent of samples fully replicated in a stepwise manner. Uh, this is shown here on our, our uh, table on the right. So at 100% replication, just to orient you, everything is being run in triplicate. At 0% replication, nothing is being run in triplicate. And because we selected just 10 samples, right, each time we're reducing 10%, we're just failing to reduce one more sample. Uh, the number of unique simulations that this uh, entails is shown here in this column. 
And then we're sort of looking at cost savings because ultimately that's what our client is looking for. Like, can they save a uh, sample cost by uh, reducing replication? And then what sort of penalties are they going to pay to do that? Now, what we haven't talked about yet is the way that we're going to quantify our information loss or noise gain. We've worked through a couple examples where we show that it's possible and lucky for us, there's easily adaptable language that we can use. Uh, a lot of you are probably already familiar with what a confusion matrix looks like, but for those of you who aren't, it's a way that we can classify observations between an observed and expected result, right? So in our case, the full triplicate analysis uh, serves as our expected result and each of our simulations is going to uh, act as an individual observation. So the classifications that we, we can get are shown on the slide where we can have uh, true positives, which are kept in, in both uh, our triplicate and scenario, uh, true negatives that are removed from both of our triplicate and scenario. And this means that ultimately our scenario is performing well and we kind of color code these cells you know, as a green light to, to visually represent that. And then we also have uh, uh, where the uh, instances where our uh, observed experiment is not performing well, right? So we have false positives that are removed from our triplicate result, but ultimately kept in our simulation, that's added noise. And then false negatives that are kept in our triplicate result, but removed from our simulation, and that's data loss, like we've talked about before. Now, using these confusion matrix classifications, we can go one step further in our calculation and arrive at a false discovery rate and false negative rate. And we want to think of these colloquially as the percentage of things uh, that we shouldn't have kept out of all the things that we did keep in the experiment. Uh, and for the false negative rate, we want to think of this as the percentage at which we're removing something from our experiment that was actually kept in the triple gate analysis. And so these two ratios are, are what we're going to use to quantify the information loss and gain as we conduct our simulations. And to move quickly through these illustrated examples one more time, we come back to this, this uh, cartoon where we were looking at each of the replicates of one of our samples. And we see that we can then take our tabular outputs and classify them based on what was happening in our triplicate analysis. We look at what was happening in each of our injections. And then when we go uh, to, to sum these up, we can, we can uh, sort out our different classifications. And what we end up with in this exercise is six total true positives, five total true negatives, four false positives, and, and zero false negatives. So across our, our possible combinations in this, in this little cartoon, we end up with a false discovery rate of 0.4 and a false negative rate of, of zero. And so in our little example, reducing replication doesn't result in any information loss. Uh, we've got a zero value for our false negative rate, but we do see a lot of uh, a noise gain that's introduced into, into our data, uh, where we see that you know, in many cases, uh, we have features one and two uh, that are being kept when they should have been thrown away in our full triplet analysis. And to observe the effect of replication reduction at the feature level, we have to consider more than one sample and so I'm bringing back that finally that illustration we looked at earlier with the three samples in triplicate and the tabulated result of, the, uh, of our web app's decision on those features. And in the earlier example, all occurrences of feature two were filtered out. Uh, we looked at that and then showed that in our tabular outputs, they're removed. Um, but if we compare this to a scenario where we're only considering one replicate of our first sample, this gray sample, well, we can arrive uh, at a place where all of a sudden, feature two is passing our filtering decisions, and now it's kept in sample one, right? So uh, uh, in this case, the occurrences of feature two in the gray sample is now viable, and we can see that in our tabulated results, feature two is no longer removed. Um, this results in feature two being a false positive uh, at the feature level, and then we can go ahead and uh, do our classifications and calculations for our feature level occurrences too when we compare this, tab, uh, this part of our outputs um, to the column of our, our truth scenario, our full triplicate analysis. So hopefully that, that quick introduction puts us sort of all on the same page, but I wanted to provide some contextual questions for, for our simulation experiment. Um, we obviously want to know what our data penalties are at a given replication percent. And to do this, we're going to look at false negative and discovery metrics. Uh, more concretely, we want to answer the question, how many features do we gain or lose at a given scenario? 
Um, and looking at first at the occurrence level, our data shows increases in both loss and gain with decreased replication. So in all of these plots, full triplicate analysis is going to be on the far right, and uh, single replication is going to be on the far left. We have false discovery on the right and false negative, or excuse me, left and false negative on the right. Um, and we can see that as we move from right to left, our data penalties increase. Um, basically, we're about 10 times more likely to keep occurrences we should have removed than we are to remove something that should have been kept. And when we zoom out to the feature level, we don't see as stark of a difference between information gain and loss. In both cases, we see the same trend, increasing penalties with decreased replication. Uh, from a zero to 90% replication, our false discovery rate changes about one order of magnitude and the false negative rate only changes about a factor of four. Uh, the penalty for a false negative rate appears more linear than that of the false discovery rate. So you're losing about the same amount of information each step, at least relative to the noise you're gaining. Um, and one thing we wanted to point out was that the steepest penalty additions are occurred uh, for our false discovery in terms of noise gain at these first couple steps. Uh, and our false negative rate, we're uh, losing important things in our first couple steps, but also here in our last step, we have one of our largest jumps. So for data or for, for noise, basically if you're okay at 50% replication here at your penalty, you might as well keep going. Um, but if, if losing important things is, is what you're concerned about, then you may wanna think a little bit more critically. I'm converting this into a concrete value. Here I'm gonna show really quick the absolute values of features that we erroneously gained. This is our fault, our, our absolute false positive count on the left. Uh, and then things that we lost are false, are false negative count on the right. We again see the increase with reduced replication, but the shapes of the trends are slightly different. We gain false positives quickly as we drop out of our first few replicates, uh, while our biggest gains in our, uh, our false negatives come with the removal of the final replicate, which I highlighted on the last slide. Uh, go ahead, if we go ahead and divide these by the, the full number of features in our data set, we had about 7,000 features. We can look at the incurred data penalty as a percentage of the data. Uh, with no replication, we're maxing out at about 8% of our included features being uh, noise, and just under 3%, uh, a little over 2% of our features that we should have kept are removed. Now, going back to our absolute counts, but converting our x-axis uh, to the percent cost that we alluded to uh, during the study design slide, uh, we look at what we might say. So if we just assume a really simple scenario where a contractor charges a grant for a first injection and 500 for each replicate, uh, basically we're, we're looking at up to savings of half of our sample budget if we go to 0%, 45% if we sit at 10% replication. Um, and then what we wanted to highlight when we were talking to our clients is that look like one grand is not what you're being charged. You know, your it, samples can be a lot more expensive than this for, for high resolution mass spec, non-targeted analyses, and uh, no guarantee you get um, a 50% uh, discount for each of your additional replicas as well. So looking at what you could possibly save or where you could cut costs, it might actually be a feasible way to move forward. Uh, about whether or not the uh, false negatives or the, the information that we're losing or uh, noise that we're gaining actually matters. And so um, what I wanted to do was pursue a follow-up question of whether or not there was a relationship um, between our data penalty and the abundance of the, the features that we're looking at. Uh, so for this, we calculated the mean feature abundance across all of our samples, uh, sorted the samples by that mean, then ranked them according to the sort. So what we're um, showing here on the left is, is a GIF of the, the rank order versus the mean abundance. And so basically all of our largest features are going to be in the top left and our smallest are going to be in the bottom right. Uh, we included a, a dashed red line at about 10 to the four is that's the abundance limit for features that are sort of above instrumental noise on the particular setup that we're looking at. Um, and we can see that as far as information loss goes, our false negatives, a lot of our worst offenders, um, they're colored and sized by how frequently they differ from full triplicate analysis. A lot of them are, in, are amongst our smallest features. And so this bears out when we look at the total distributions of these uh, in the plot on the right. Um, this is just uh, you know box plots uh, um, split out by which quartile the feature belongs to. 
uh, and looking at the false negative counts. And we're far more likely to lose something uh, as uh, that we should have kept as data if it's a larger feature. And so based off of the likelihood that somebody is going to go ahead and do manual review, um, it, it's quite possible that they're going to run into even fewer uh, uh, false negatives than, uh, than we'd think if they're just focusing on the first and second quartiles. Um, the distribution for the false positives is a little bit different. Uh, basically, if something's large uh, and it's not and it's originally removed from the data, it's far more likely to be included. Um, and so while it's less likely for us to lose real features from our subset of the largest abundance features, those features are the most likely to be noise if they weren't originally true. And we're, we're showing a similar GIF where, as you look, if we go through our replication scenarios, uh, we get many more dark and large colors uh, up in our second and then a little bit into our first quartile. And so in summary, high abundance peaks are less likely to be thrown away, but far more likely to be added as noise. I'm gonna to toss up a couple other questions that we're, we're actively pursuing. I'm looking about at specific compound classes on PFAS, uh, whether these trends look the same in different data sets, and then whether or not a pool sample can help uh, sort of protect you from information loss if you choose to reduce replicates. Um, and thank you again for, for having me. It was, it was great to come out and chat with everybody. Um, I'm not sure how much I think I used all of my time, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them by email. Um, or if we have time live. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Simone, do you like to take it from here? Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So I guess I think my talk ties in very well with the uh, Tori's talk because uh, after you have detected all these features and you are sure that you have reliable data, then the next step is annotating this feature that is uh, a nightmare. And hopefully I'll, I'll be able to give you some insight of like new solution on how to uh, annotate features. So uh, yeah, my name is Simone Duff. I'm a postdoc at UC San Diego in the Dorsting Group. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to a tool that we have developed in our lab in the past year called Micromast. Uh, that is a tool dedicated to mass spectrometry analysis and targeted uh, that hopefully will help you to identify uh, microbial and fungal metab metabolites. So uh, I'm not sure how diverse is this audience, but in our lab, we focused a lot on the fact that the gut microbiota, so all these bacteria and other microorganisms that live in our uh, gastrointestinal tract influence human health. Uh, all these bacteria actually produce constantly thousands, if not millions of different molecules that can reach all kinds of organs in our body, from the brain to the heart to the liver. These bacteria produce uh, very important molecules that we know already. For example, ener energy metabolites, neurotransmitter, vitamins. But what is most exciting is that they can produce many more probably unknown molecule that we are trying to identify that have a known function. So uh, that's extremely um, exciting. Um, and metabolomics always uh, clearly ties very well to uh, the study of the gut microbiota and understanding of how this molecule influence uh, our health. So hopefully since you are all working meta metabolomics, you agree with me that the human uh, metabolism provides a very quantitative direct re readout of health diseases. It's like the, the omics that gives you a most representative example of a phenotype. Uh, and usually uh, it works like this. In our case, we don't work with uh, water samples, uh, but we pick usually like the most horrible diseases and we compare it to healthy people. You collect all different kinds of biosamples, can be blood, stool, urines, uh, and then you run it through your favorite uh, instrument, in our case, a max spectrometer, and then you try to make sense of all uh, the mess uh, that the data looks like. Um, the gut bacteria produce a lot of molecules. I just want to give you some, a brief example of uh, some good molecules and other that are bad. Uh, one of the interested ones that has been recently published uh, 
is indole-3 lactate that is produced by my favorite bacteria, bifidospecies, uh, that is known to uh, reduce inflammation through the modulation of uh, immune cells. The bacteria, they don't only produce uh, healthy molecules, they can produce also bad ones. A very good example is colibactin that uh, is produced by E. coli and other interbacteriaceae uh, that has been shown to be involved with colorectal cancer and IBD development. So how did we study uh, molecule produced by this microorganism? Uh, we used, as I mentioned before, mass spectrometry. Uh, in this case, though, uh, the field, I would say, they could be mainly split into different kind of philosophy and approaches. One is for targeted metabolomics that is usually used for hypothesis testing. Uh, it's quantitative and uh, though it's limited to uh, standards that are commercially available and primary uh, metabolites uh, such as the TCA cycle metabolites. Uh, in our case, we usually focus on untargeted metabolomics that is uh, provides a reality quantification of the features that you detect is more uh, um, prone to hypothesis generation. And what we are also focusing on is the, the discovery of novel molecules. But uh, there is a massive drawback in this approach, uh, and it's uh, the dark side of untargeted metabolomics. Basically, for most of the things that we acquired, we have no idea what we are looking at. Um, for example, uh, when we are working usually with stool samples, uh, we are able nowadays to annotate 10% uh, of what we observe. This has increased from 2016 to 2024, so nowadays. But what is very um, interesting is that within what we can annotate in this dark matter is that the microbial, truly unique microbial metabolites are actually very limited. They represent only 1% of what we actually can annotate. And this does not reflect at all the enormous genetic potential of this microbial community that uh, inhabit our gut that are, that are called microbiome that can encode for a hundred times more gene of the human genome. So there is a lot of genetic potential for molecules to be produced and discovered. So how do we tackle this, this problem? So we know that what we can capture through untargeted metabolomics experiments are annotated molecules that we already know of, but also molecules that are coming from all kinds of exposure. For example, the food you eat, the drugs you take, the environment, uh, and obviously for stool samples, but also other biofluids, molecules that are produced by bacteria or other microorganisms. To make sense of this mess, it seems like a daunting pro project, but luckily for us, uh, the metabolomics community has started to deposit more and more data in a uh, public repository. So we had this idea of building a tool that allows you to interrogate this public repository, compare what you observe in this repository to, to your experiments, and try to make sense of the features that you are detecting. In this case, through this compar repository comparison, we will be able to tell you if an observed features uh, is being already observed to be produced by bacteria, or the very powerful thing is that the, these features, even if it's like an unknown one, we will also able to associate it to a possible producer. So the paper has been recently published, like just two months ago. Uh, the community was very excited about it, so if you didn't have any chance to to read the paper, please uh, have a look at it. Uh, and today I'll just give you a quick introduction on how we build it and how it works. So in order to build this tool, basically we started collecting data and generating a reference database. So we started using GMPS Massive uh, repository, uh, is one of the main uh, metabolomics repository for MSMS data together with metabolites and metabolomics workbench. So we scraped all the information from GMPS Massive uh, on monocultures of um, microorganisms that can be bacteria, fungi, and archaea. And then we also uh, used the metadata that was associated to uh, this sample. For, to do this, we used another tool that has been developed in our lab called Redo. 
Uh, then we turn to the community through Peter, that is our in-house Twitter style. Uh, we asked the community to deposit even more data that was acquired from monocultures of bacteria or fungi in order to enrich our uh, reference database. And the response was like amazing. In just like a few months, uh, more than 25 different search groups from all over the world deposited more data. So at the end, we end up uh, with more than 100 million MSMS spectra that were acquired from bacteria, fungi, archaea, and also we had some negative controls that I'll mention more later. So now we have like a lot of data, but all this data is useless if you not if you cannot quickly search through it. Luckily for us, Ming Wang, that uh, was a postdoc in our lab, now is at UC Riverside as an assistant professor, was developing a fast search tool that uh, basically allows you to index all the spectra that are in your reference database uh, in order to quickly search through them. So in this case, uh, before previous iteration of our tools that are, for example, if some of you are familiar with this called MUST, uh, would allow you to search only one spectra uh, against our database. And that search would more or less take um, 20, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, with this new approach uh, through the indexing uh, and restrict searching against uh, precursors mass that have the same uh, values and a high chance to have a similarity uh, cosine score, uh, the search takes only less than a second actually. So that's dr drastically improve our searchability. Uh, so now we have a lot of data and we can quickly search through it. Um, what we need next, it's a way to make sense of uh, the results and the data that we are investigating. So we decided to build a taxonomic tree to visualize the output of your search. As I mentioned before, uh, from the uh, repository, we were able to extract 100 million MSMS spectra coming from 60,000 uh, unique files from bacteria, fungi, archaea, and then we also decided to add human cell lines in order to give you an information of uh, host-derived metabolites, and also QC uh, and blanks were also added to this uh, repository database in order to use them as a negative control. So from all these files, we were able to extract uh, around uh, 2,000, uh, more than 2,000 NCBI IDs for taxonomic names, uh, for which we decided to then generate a taxonomic tree. So this represented a challenge uh, because we decided to generate a taxonomic tree instead of phylogenetic one, because most of this sample, the vast majority did not have any genomic data associated. So we didn't want to infer any um, genomes. Um, a lot of the time, strains and species that were deposited uh, by the community were actually not uh, already available on NCBIs. Uh, so we mapped them to the closest species or previous taxon level uh, that was available. And additionally, we had to generate a multi-domain uh, tree. So in this case, we, generate, we decided to go for a taxonomy tree. So from these NCBI IDs, we were able to create uh, a taxonomy tree with almost 3,000 nodes that uh, is spanning three different domains, uh, a lot of phyla. And as you can see, if, uh, if you are familiar with uh, bacteria, um, it covers a lot of bacteria that can be found in uh, uh, the gut, but also uh, environmental bacteria, because uh, the people involved in the environmental uh, metabolomics are actually very good at depositing um, data. So basically, this is a tool. We decide, we scraped all this information to generate a reference database of monocultures of bacteria that allows you to search for your own MSMS spectra that can be of a known or unknown molecule against this database and then visualize if the spectra was found in any taxa that was already been um, acquired previously. Um, then Robin Schmidt, that was a postdoc previously uh, in our group, now it's uh, uh, in Prague, uh, put everything together in a very nice web application that is extremely 
uh, easy to use. And I'll just showcase briefly how it works. So when you search for the My Commands, this is what you get is a, a HTML website where you can see uh, different uh, boxes. So to do the search, you can either uh, add a spectrum universal, a uni universal uh, spectrum identifier. Uh, if you are not familiar with this, basically it's the equivalent of a URL, uh, but for uh, mass, uh, for uh, spectra. Um, or if you are more traditional, you can just basically take your spectrum, MSMS spectrum, and then copy paste here, um, fragment ions, the precursor mass, um, then you can just decide some parameters for your search. You can keep the default one. Usually they work well. And then you just have to click search. So when you click search in just basically one second, uh, the results are visualized. You can visualize the taxonomic tree inter that is interactive one. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can see the results. So in the, our case, the spectrum was matching E. coli, Klebsiella. When you put your uh, cursors on top of the of the pies, you can see that uh, there are the taxonomic name, scientific name, how many samples were found uh, in that specific um, uh, taxa. You can collapse a different level, uh, the tree to visualize it as you prefer, and also three different tabs were, um, were generated, are generated. The first one is the library match. So when you perform the search of your a specific MS, MSMS spectrum of interest is also searched against the GMPS library that has more than 600,000 uh, library spectra. In this case, for this example, I was actually searching for um, a library spectrum, the one for Yersinia Bactim. So you can see that we have a perfect matching from the cosine scores uh, and it's annotated. So uh, the another tab that is generated is called dataset match, where you can see in which of the taxa the spectrum was ob actually observed. And not only, you can also click and uh, inspect with the mirror plot uh, the two matching spectra. So you can manually visualize and inspect all the matches uh, that the tool is reporting. And finally, you have a taxa uh, matches uh, tab where you can see at different taxonomic levels. So this is a higher level, for example, if this is our bacteria, you can see that we had 110 uh, matches to bacterial samples uh, looking for Yersinia bactin, and we have 44,000 uh, bacterial sample in the reference database. So basically this is how MicroMast work. Um, I just also want to showcase that MicroMast is accurate. For example, when you search for a uh, molecule of, of uh, interest for uh, the medical field, for example, of a statin that is a cholesterol low lowering drug that is was originally isolated from aspergillus and salinosporamide that is a phase three candidate for glioblastoma that is only produced by salinospora. When we search for sepa separately for these two molecules, we actually found matches only to the respective known producer. So showcasing that we don't have like off target matches. So the next question is like, can we extract uh, putative microbial metabolites from untargeted metabolomics experiments? Uh, so in the paper showcase this example, I just want to show you here. So we work with the data set that um, we really like in our lab is the queen data set from a nature paper of some years ago. Uh, where germ-free mice, so mice that were not colonized by any kind of microorganism, were uh, compared to uh, specific pathogen-free mice, so mice that were col colonized by microorganism. And from all these animals, uh, all kinds of tissues and biosamples were collected, brain, fecal samples, uh, urines, heart, lungs, liver, like all kinds of tissue. So I took this data set, and then I compare between the two different groups and I extract only MSMS spectra that were uh, observed exclusively in the one that in the animals that were colonized by bacteria. With the idea is that if the molecule was only observed in these animals, it was probably uh, derived by 
uh, microbial metabolism. So after in this filtering, I end up with 10,000 MSMS spectra. And then through a Python code, I was able to do a bus a, a batch search and search this 10,000 MSMS spectrum against the MicroMast reference database. These 10,000 searches was almost would have taken almost six years to do it previously with MAST, and now it took me only two hours. And this is also an example of how fast we are uh, in searching MSMS spectra. Uh, so I was able, out of these 10,000 spectra, to uh, observe 3,000 of them matching to any kind of uh, microbial monoculture, suggesting that are possible for microbially derived. And then I applied an extra uh, step of filtering in order to qu be quite sure on, of our reservation. So I removed all the spectra we're also finding on in human cell lines and QC blank. So this is also showcasing how we can use the negative controls. And then we perform a validation step. So I searched this spectra against another data um, data sets. In this case, it was a data set using looking at antibiotic usage. So with the idea is that if the micro if these microbial molecules were observed uh, only in uh, animals not receiving antibiotics, that would also strengthen our hypothesis that those are actually unknown or known microbial molecules. So at the end, I end up with 500 MSMS spectra. Uh, these spectra actually are available uh, through the paper if you want to investigate them. Some are, are known molecules, and most of them are unknown. So when, you end, I, when we end up with this 500 uh, spectra, I was able to observe it that uh, how they were distributed across the phyla and what were also their predicted uh, classes using Sirius and Canopus uh, tools predict, for prediction. Uh, you can see that uh, a lot of like the molecules that were shared across uh, the different phyla were actually terpenoids, while classified as terpenoids, while the molecules that were probably more unique to the different phyla were alkaloids or small amino acid and peptide. So the idea is that uh, how also this can be relevant and applicable to human health. Um, so we took these 500 uh, spectra and we searched them against all the human data that has been deposited in GMPS Massive uh, that also had uh, um, associated metadata. So I was able that, to find that those 500 um, spectra, 450 of them were actually observed across there a lot of different tissues in humans. We have all kinds of tissues, cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid, lungs, heart. Obviously, most of the matches were coming to stools. And also, you can see that we also have very different disease condi condition for the humans that were investigated. A lot of them were found in healthy uh, and obese, uh, obese people. And again, you can see that this representation are the number of matches that this spectra were uh, able to obtain. Uh, obviously, I have a lot of uh, matches to stool because these microbial metabolites are mostly probably found in stools, but also because we have thousands of thousands of stool samples in the reference database. But this, again, recapitulates and showcase how microbial metabolites that are probably produced, mostly produced in the gut, can actually reach and be found uh, in all different tissues of the human body across the human body. So I just want, want to leave you with a final example. Uh, obviously, it's about uh, the novel conjugated microbial bi bile acid that we are working a lot on in our lab. This is a uh, phenylalanicolic acid that it was uh, recently described in the Nature paper that Emily Gentry uh, published, uh, showcasing how this molecule is actually probably higher uh, in presence in individuals with IBD, uh, suggesting this molecule to be a possible um, biomarker for the disease. So I took this molecule, I took the MSMS spectrum of phenylalanicolic acid, and then I searched it with micromas to see if we could identify possible producer, bacteria producer of this molecule. Interesting, I was able to observe that this molecule was produced by Enterococcus fecium, uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum, E. coli, 
that were all bacteria that were already previously been associated with uh, IBD in literature, just through 16S or metagenomics analysis, not with metabolomics, suggesting that probably uh, the one of the function of this bacteria could also be pr pr producing this uh, molecule and this is the activity that might be leading to um, IBD or other disease in surgeons. And the very cool thing is also that this data, for example, was acquired years previously, previous the, the uh, identification of phenylalanine cholic acid. So we can retrospectively use this tool to search uh, for novel molecule of interest in data that was acquired years ago. So hopefully I'm on time and as a take home message, I just want to say that the untargeted metabolomics world is dark and scary. Hopefully we are able to shine a light on it through the standards and, uh, and annotated metabolites. But with Micromast, hopefully we're also able to point you if like for example, a known molecule of interest are coming from bacteria, fungi, on archaea, and possibly we will also help you to associate these molecules to respective producers. So this hopefully will help you then design more mechanistic study to validate uh, your fundings. Um, hopefully, obviously, it takes a village to do to do this. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the two. Um, uh, main first author of the paper, also Robin and Annalise for uh, the idea and the work they put in the project, and also Ming and Peter uh, for supporting this, and a lot on every other team uh, in my lab. And that's it. I would take any question. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely have time for questions. Thank you, Simone. Um, all right, with that, uh, thank you, Simone. And uh... <clears throat> and uh troy and uh um with that uh yeah we'll be sending out an updated email we'll also post the recordings in the next week and if you'd like to get in contact any of the audience members with the presenters we'll happily facilitate that too um thanks everyone have a great day thank you for presenting this morning and troy